Okay, um, so since Trustee Butler Perez is technically here while she's logging in, I'm going to call the meeting to order. Nanette, will you please take the attendance? Yes, let me. Um, let me we do have three. Oh, oh, wait a minute. I apologize. No, we have we have our quorum. We have a quorum, right? We yes. Do. Yep. Quorum. Yep. If Tony is there, yeah. If Trustee Tony is there, we have a quorum. So, Mary Kate, Janae McDonald, present. Tonya Butler, present. Okay. Gladys Bed Garcia, Will Bill Johnson, and Betty Sposito. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We're gonna start out with the enrollment outlook and update from Dr. DeBurley. Hi, good evening, everyone. I think that um, I'm gonna kick us off. Um, so uh, for the enrollment management perspective. Um, and so I'll kick us off with um, just a snapshot in time, a look at day 73 of registration for headcount registered credits, uh, talk a little bit about vaccination compliance. Then I'll turn it over to Dr. DeBurley, who will uh, do some program enrollment by school. And then we'll both have some remarks uh, related to dental assisting. Next slide, please. So this is uh, the daily enrollment report. So this is a snapshot that you're familiar with at this point. Uh, if we're reading the slide from left to right, you'll see in the shaded box, that's an overview of registration day 73 as we headed into spring 2020 spring 21 and spring 22. So what you'll see in the boxes to the right are total registered headcount and total registered credits for spring 23 point in time. So we are looking uh, at a snapshot that shows 2.4% ahead in registered credits compared to last year, as well as 4.9% in uh, registered credits ahead of last year. So the the two boxes that highlight headcount and registered credit more kind of central in the screen, uh, the white boxes with the pink border, that again is that spring 23 snapshot where we were on day 73. Next slide, please. What I wanted to highlight on this screen is a, a little bit longer view. So you can see point in time uh, all the way back to spring of 2018. And so I just wanted to highlight for everyone that while we're ahead of uh, last year at the same uh, point in time, we are markedly down uh, since uh, spring of 2018, about 31.5%. So. I could call your attention to the leftmost side of the screen in spring of 2018, where we were at 49,844 credits on this registration day compared to 34,134 credits for spring 23. Next slide, please. So we continue to work really hard on our student vaccination policy compliance. It's a collaborative effort between uh, academic affairs, student affairs, information technology, you name it, all hands on deck for making sure that our students get their compliance records in. You can see uh, on this snapshot in time, again, day 73 of registration, we're at 98.8% uh, compliance across LAPS, SHIPS, and STEM. 94% of students taking a course with an on-campus component are fully vaccinated, and we have about 6% of our students who received uh, a reasonable accommodation. And this could include students who also were in VAX series, and so we give them a little bit of extra time in order to uh, become compliant with the policy. This is uh, about on par with where we were last year. I think last year we were at 92% uh, and uh, for full compliance or, or with the on-campus component and um, for 8% uh, with the reasonable accommodation. So we're still seeing some success when it comes to uh, student compliance. And uh, just a note that when it came time to deregister students who were not compliant, 
Uh, only 11 students were impacted for a total of 63 credits. Uh, in comparison, last spring, there were 32 students impacted for a total of 184 credits. So we feel like we're doing a really good job communicating with students and working with them on the compliance for this policy so that there's no disruption to the way in which they would like to take courses and be engaged with the college. Are there Excuse any other questions? Yes. Yeah, excuse me, I got a question on this. Uh, I don't know if it's you or Dr. Cook, though. And in light of all the information that's come out, especially over the last year, why are we still pushing this vaccine when, when it first came out, it said, oh, get the vaccine and you will not get sick? Then it was, well, you, you may still get sick, but you're only going to get a little sick. Then it was, get the vaccine, you won't infect anybody else. And it's like, oh, you still can be a carrier. With all we know about the COVID vaccine and, and what it does or does not do, I guess my question is why are we still pushing this? Whether we lost six students or 11 students, um, it should be, you know, it gets my body, my right. Uh, I just don't understand why we're still pushing this. No. And well, so uh, one, wait, one moment, Dr. Cook, I'm sorry, before you interject. Um, I just, can we, if possible, I think, I think this, this is probably the, the bulk of the presentation, not the bulk of the presentation, but the bulk of the slides um, and in-depth information that we're looking at tonight, Trustee Johnson. So once she is done, can we come back to that question? Because I would still like her to get through the rest of the presentation. Is there is there more on the COVID-19 or is this is this the only slide? No, on but, no I, I, but for example, I have a question about a slide about two, three slides ago, but I'm going to wait until... Um, Darcy's total presentation is done, and then we can have questions. And that's you want to wait. That you want to wait to the end for the questions, not as the subject matter moves forward. I couldn't hear you, Trustee Johnson. You want to wait. Talking. You want to wait until the meeting is over instead of dealing with the subject matter while it's fresh in our minds. You no, wait. I want to wait until her portion of the presentation is done. Right, but so this is I the final you to make a note of it. The COVID. This is I'm the making final a note of it, of and so I'm saying we can come back to it, Trustee Johnson. Whatever and I'm going like to allow to Darcy to continue her presentation. Whatever you would like to do. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee McDonald. I was going to actually transition over to Dr. DeBurley. Uh, and then again, she and I will uh, conclude our remarks uh, with some notes and information regarding dental assisting. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that. Now that your portion is done, um, Dr. Cook, you are getting ready to interject and provide an answer to Trustee Johnson. Yeah, I'll, I'll take it in the most fair-minded way in which Trustee Johnson asked the question. Um, for starters, this is a policy, right, that has been agreed to move forward by all 15 Massachusetts community colleges. So we don't necessarily have the ability at the STCC level to singularly change course. With that said, the presidents are very much, Trustee Johnson, looking at this. What we wanted was a little bit of continuity. We started the academic year with the policy. We want to see that through with this semester. So that's why, again, not, not pushing it, just looking for that level of consistency with students who were here fall and now, of course, into spring as well. But it's definitely getting re revisited. And what we also see is certainly at the federal level, uh, the telegraphing about potentially pulling down the emergency orders related to COVID-19. Obviously, that's a, a very big change in all this as well. The way that lines up is where we're looking ahead is um, where we will be for summer and fall. Again, we, we need a little bit of time as the 15 community colleges to, to land in a place. So I guess it's like my mom has said, if somebody's going to jump off a bridge, you're going to follow them. I just, anyway, it, it, it's, I just want to be on record that I think this is ridiculous and it's time to, uh, Time to move forward. That's all. Um, thank you. Um, I do have a question um, from the headcount and registered credits. So maybe just a little, ex not explanation, but or just some understanding. So I know that 31% number seems like a lot coming from 2018. But is it correct to say that we are still on a positive rebound um, moving forward and increasing those number of registered credits, especially since recovering from COVID um, and things like that, or the program structure of, or the impact of COVID. Yeah, you can you can see from our, our, our trend data that that's exactly right when you're looking at it from a 
comparing this spring, day 73 to last spring. We're ahead. We're ahead in headcount and registered credits. It's actually just a coincidence that the continuing student number is exactly the same at this point in time comparison. So that's not a typo, but it shows that we've done a lot of efforts to continue to work with our continuing students to help them persist and be enrolled. Where you'll see the head count bounce back a little bit more is in the new. Uh, so that's 841 new students compared to last year at this time, 754. But it's also good to like just keep going back, right? So you think about, you know, spring 20 was that first spring semester of our COVID curtailment, right? And so we had 970 students point in time. So so I'm I'm always a glass half full person and I like to be, and every everybody knows I'm like competitive and I want to do everything, like leave no stone unturned. So I'm always excited when we're trending ahead, but I also wanted to just be transparent about like taking a broader look back to see, you know, where we were even back in, you know, pre-pandemic conditions. Um, lots of great work, as you've, you've noted, um, has uh, helped us see this little bit of a bounce forward, I would say. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, it's Betty. I just have a quick question too from uh, the previous information from uh, Darcy's presentation. Um, how do we rank with the other community colleges? How are we looking? I know we're technical, so we have some different programs, et cetera, but how do we look? So I can share anecdotal only because we aren't even at our freeze data yet. So it'll be a couple more weeks before we can be official in our report out. So I would say, yes, there are uh, our, some of our, our sister institutions are experiencing similar being ahead in comparison to last year uh, this time. But again, nothing it has been you know formally put out because none of us are at freeze date yet. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We're moving on to Dr. DeBurley's portion of this presentation. Okay, thanks so much. <clears throat> uh, what you, the first slide you've got there is uh, a, a comparison of the school enrollments uh, across lap, uh, LAPS, STEM, and SHIPS. Note, of course, as, as I think all, both Darcy and I keep saying, these are slices in time. So the, the data you've got there is from uh, January 25th. Uh, actually, the data from uh, yesterday looks looks a bit better uh, and has increased by, let's say, a 92 headcount for the three schools, plus the fact that between, and you have the difference between fall and spring, we graduated 179 students uh, over the fall and winter terms. So that also makes up for some, that shows a, a little bit of the difference. Uh, between fall and spring, but we do have attrition traditionally between fall and spring. Part of the big effort that Darcy referred to was in really increasing that retention, not to see such dramatic drops as we've seen in the past. And that in fact was successful. We go to the next slide. Uh, and this is just a, a matter of information for the, the trustees on how, what percentage of online um, versus in-person some face-to-face uh, -face components. We have quite a few of our courses that have a hybrid component. So there is, uh, they meet face-to-face, -face, but they also have an online component. But just to show you that basically LAPS, the liberal and professional studies is still heavily online. And we're seeing that very much with the way our students vote. We offer them options of face-to-face. -face. They're not taking it. We have to cancel those classes. Uh, they're, they're preferring the online. In STEM and SHIPS, where you have, um, certainly in SHIPS, in the health programs, you have a very heavy face-to-face -face component required uh, because of all the clinicals and because of the accreditation process. In STEM, you see the number, uh, what we basically have is a pattern of a lot of um, labs, the labs which tend to be in person, but the lectures that are online. So that sort of explains the differences there and what's going on in the nature of those courses. All right, let's go on to the next one. Here you have a, um, a program enrollment by school in, a, in selected programs. This is a slide I've shown you over the last two or three years. So there's consistency there in, in the selection. But I do note uh, 
sort of to the right there under degrees and certificates. And it's in several cases, you have uh, several programs, both uh, if you get total enrollment for that, for that area. But for example, uh, when you've got business, we've got four different programs that are sort of put together there in engineering transfer, we've got six. So I've given you the sum total to show you, to show you what's happened. But again, we've had um, an overall increase um, uh, in the headcounts since that date of the 25th and uh, a slight increase in, in credits as well since the 25th. And basically what you're looking at too is that uh, programs such as health science have continued, have continued to increase. And I do wanna remark the difference when you see the general studies um, that liberal arts court program there, and you see a, a great reduction of, of numbers there. But there's also, it's also reflected in a sense in the increase in health sciences because there's been a great effort to try to get students more into a particular career. And so quite a few of the students who had sort of looked at general studies have been directed and have, have gone ahead and applied for health science. Now health science, of course, gives them an opportunity to look at a number of health science options, but at least it's putting them on, on, on a career path and less sort of general, general education. So that does account for some of the difference in the, in the increase of health science and the sort of reduction in general studies. Um, the enrollments in criminal justice continue to decline and that seems to be part of the nature of what's going on across the country. Um, our human services and social work, those programs in fact, right now actually they're at level, I show a, a negative 2% there, but in fact right now, they're actually up to they're up to level with what uh, what the numbers were in the fall, uh, and then the others are uh, continue um, have 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 declined a bit again predictable numbers in the declines from from fall to spring. Next slide. Uh, the next few slides are our programs. Uh, some programs which we brought back um, that were discontinued and have returned. And I'm really uh, providing just an information to the, uh, to the trustees as to how those programs are doing. Um, uh, I also wanna note that one of, one of the challenges when you look at program enrollment is that students may be enrolled in a program but may not be actually taking any courses in the program itself. Uh, and that's something that we see uh, when we look at the course numbers that are, are associated with the program because some of these students have not met the prerequisites either in math or English before they can enroll in some of these programs. So as you see in civil engineering technology, uh, where we are in spring, we have a total basically, actually it, it says 15, again, that's the date of the 25th. I did look to check and we actually have uh, a couple of more students in there. So we really are up to 17. Uh, whereas in the fall, we had 23 students enroll. There were no graduates from the program between the uh, fall and winter, uh, fall and uh, the spring. And I've also provided you with uh, one of our challenges is, as you see, our spring enrollments, um, median class size is six. Uh, we usually really are much more comfortable with having at least 12 students in a class, uh, if not more. And I've provided you average course enrollments uh, since the fall of 2020 for the program. I've also provided you in these next few slides as well, what peak enrollment looked like in those programs. So in the case of uh, the civil engineering tech program, the peak enrollment was back in 2011 when there were 41 students uh, in the pro enrolled in the program uh, in the AS and another five. And uh, the peak in the certificate of completion was back in 2013 when we had five. I've also provided you with an average annual completion rates there, uh, again, for all of these programs. And as you see, the average completion rate um, between 2011 and 2021 for the AS were four students. The next slide. So here you have the same kind of information for landscape design. Uh, again, this is a discontinued program which was uh, brought back. Um, we have, as, as can note, uh, 
And we have the actually now uh, the same amount of students as uh, the 13 students in the in the spring. We had 16 students totally in total enrolled in the fall. There were no fall graduates. I've provided you with the same information. Uh, the median class size in the landscape program is five students. Uh, and our annual completion rates, again, over those 10 years, uh, were three students in the AS and one. What we find there, again, peak enrollments were back in 2016 at 32 students in the AS and eight in 2014 for the CO, for the complete certificate of completion. I think what happens very much in landscape is people take a few courses and then leave because they're able to, to they're either getting particular information they want from some of those courses, and then they, uh, having gotten that, they, they go ahead and leave. The next is uh, the optics photonics. Um, that program was not one that was under discontinued, but it does, um, it does have a, a low enrollment uh, overall. But I have provided again, just, just to bring to the trustees attention, uh, the program enrollment again in the fall, uh, in total had 29 students. Uh, the peak enrollment in this program was back in 2012 with 31, uh, 31 students uh, in the uh, associate's degree. This spring, we went from the 29 students basically to 19 students, uh, 16 in the AS you have there. And again, I've provided you with a median class size on course enrollments. I've provided you with the graduation rates and uh, what we have there. I do wanna note that one of the things that happened which actually brought enrollment up was a uh, sponsorship from an entity called Propel America that had provided some scholarships and actually some summer support to students. And that uh, did seem to impact the, en the enrollment for the optics and photonics program, but Propel now has withdrawn that support. So that is no longer available. Thank you. Next one. And here we have this, the dental assistant program outlook. Uh, dental assisting again was a discontinued program that, that, um, um, that was brought back. Uh, in the fall of 22, we had six students and we had six students that enrolled in the whole program and six students did graduate, uh, did complete now and are all employed, which is great. What happened with the dental assisting then is a number of things uh, were done. And so we now have 20 students enrolled in the spring. So that's really good news. Um, we have uh, new faculty uh, and we've employed 1.5. Um, we have sort of a 1.5 FTE. So uh, in that program, the spring start instead of the fall was also a change. There was also a revised curriculum. And the other thing that's has also aided for more robust enrollments is that a number of the courses uh, that were only taught as DAS just for that program are now taught under a dental sciences umbrella combined with dental hygiene. Consequently, in those programs, we're seeing much more ro robust enrollments. So I've pointed that out in the sense where I mentioned that in uh, the notes under average course enrollments in one of the, uh, the texts, text boxes where I, I've noted a number of DAS courses are now called DSC. And in those we're seeing actually 20 students in a lecture and 10 in labs. So that's a very encouraging uh, indeed. I, I know uh, Darcy is going to make also a point now about overall with dental assisting, but I do wanna just make a, a sort of conclusion about overall enrollment challenges. In the fall of 22, we had 14 students that had fewer than 45 students enrolled in the program. Uh, and nine of those were in SHIPS, seven of those in SHIPS are accredited programs. Now note in, in the health programs, accredited health programs, those students are fully enrolled in the programs. They, they're not taking other courses. However, we had four uh, programs in STEM and one in LAPS that, that came, that fell under that 45. And quite a few of them actually, four of those programs are actually um, had enrollments between six and 18. So those are things, those are certainly uh, programs that we're looking at and monitoring uh, when you're looking at that. 
And in the spring of 23, we also had, uh, so this current spring, we had 14 programs with fewer than 45 students. Again, nine of those are in shifts, seven of which are accredited. Um, the reason I'm pointing out accreditation is because there are definitive ratios that are noted that are required in accredited programs. But even so, in some of those programs, uh, we still have capacity uh, for additional enrollments and, and uh, have had some sort of enrollment challenges with those. I'm gonna turn it over to Darcy on the next slide, I believe, right? And yeah. I'd like to pause there before we turn sure. it over to Darcy. I wanna open the floor up for any questions or comments from trustees. Uh, this is Bill. I have uh, a question on the uh, landscape. If I if I listen to you correctly, you said that it appears some of the people take the course and they may get the information they need and then they exit the course. Is that correct? Yes, that seems to be what happens on the enrollments. Usually in those lower in the 100 level classes, uh, we see higher enrollments. But by the time it gets to um, uh, the second year, if you if um, I didn't if you look at the second year courses, then the enrollment is much much less. Is is there any way we could look at it maybe and and make this like a workforce development where we could just you know like much like you know some people go to a, a certain course just so they can get a license or whatever because this this was for getting a degree correct a, a um... well it is a it is a credit program there is a slight but... There is a slight complication, uh, Trustee Johnson, uh, in the rules of what happens when you take away unit work and make it non-credit. Well, that's what I'm getting at. Is it feasible to look at it to see if we can just make it into like a workforce development? Well, hey, you know, learn this and then you can get a job. If people aren't staying to get a, a, a diploma, it's like, well, maybe we can make just like a workforce development. That, that's my only question, I guess. Yeah, it would require, a, uh, it would require, because of collective bargaining, it would require a radical difference in that uh, because okay. the, because of the uh, implications for, for eliminating unit, unit work. So that, that's. Yeah. And, and would that be the same as far as eradicating for if it was to be made, it sounds like Trustee Johnson is talking about like a certificate program. So instead of it being a two year degree, maybe it's a six month or something credited certificate program. Well, we and, have, there is a certificate program in landscaping that there is a certificate of completion. It has a uh, very few students enrolled. Okay, so is there any reason why we're not finding a way to fold those into each other or? They are folded into each other. Students taking, uh, there's new students taking the certificate of completion are taking are taking courses along with the AS. That's the nature. Okay, of so is what's happening after they get their certificate of completion is that when they're leaving? Well, no, they're not. They're not getting a certificate of completion either. Oh, uh, the certificate. They're leaving of, before that. Yeah, the average the average completion rate for a certificate of completion uh, is one student, and the average completion rate for a for the AS is three students over the last those ten years. I quoted the twenty. 2011 to 2021. Okay. Okay. Um, I do have a question and I, and I think you touched on it a little bit. One of my questions was around the dental assisting versus the dental hygienist and how those kind of fold into each other. Um, you know, what are the, um, the salary outcomes, you know, for that after graduation? What is the coursework like? And, you know, is this something where we should be steering our students toward dental hygienists or, you know, I just wanted to know some of the dynamics around that. And you touched on it a little bit, but. Well, yeah, a number of students, actually, when we had those six students, a number of students that had sort of originally enrolled, and there were maybe 10, went ahead and enrolled in dental hygiene. The thing is, the dental hygiene is a competitive program. The dental assisting is not. So consequently, there are more, there are uh, prerequisites or, that need to be met for dental hygiene that do not for dental assisting. Uh, so it's, and then the dental hygiene is a, a, a two-year AS program. The dental assisting really runs over three terms in a sense. And one, uh, the last term really being mostly with placements. So it's really two terms in, in coursework. And then the last term really has to do with clinical places where there are things like radiology, you know, those kinds of things, um, then 
those, those courses were able to be combined. So those are the ones I was talking about that are the DAS courses now um, that are providing robust things. So we have uh, in that rethinking of or the restructuring of the curricula, um, the faculty there have worked very much in combining where it made the where, where it made sense and met met the requirements. And the faculty that are teaching uh, in the dental assisting program also do teach do do also teach in dental hygiene. They're qualified dental hygienists. So we've done what we, what we could to make sense of it. And actually that has shown uh, as a result um, uh, an increase in enrollments. Thank you. Do we have any other questions or comments? I have a, a quick one, it's Betty. Um, what about the job opportunities? What are we looking at here um, with the dental hygienist or dental assistant, landscaping? Um, have we looked into that as to um, demand. I know everybody I've ever gone to has come from stick. So, yeah, no, I mean, and 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 we're good with that as far as you know. The job opportunities for the dental folks um, are 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 robust, and right. we have we have also on the uh, working we have d dentists that are working uh, with the faculty on that. So uh, those those opportunities are there. What we're finding with landscaping is that, frankly, for landscaping, you don't need an AS to be working in a landscape field. Uh, so consequently, people are getting the courses they do need and then are going on. The other thing with landscaping, when you're trying to compare, is to remember that that's seasonal work. Right. So there's also a, a different factor there uh, when you look at the opportunities. So there are certainly openings for folks, but the qualifications are not requiring an AS. Thank you. Sure. Okay, if we don't have any more questions, um, Darcy, feel free, please. Yeah, this is just the, the last slide, the dental assisting marketing to matriculation. So this is an example of how we take those workforce trends and how we work with academic affairs, with faculty, with marketing, and we create a campaign that uh, speaks to, you know, the what we're offering. So this is sort of the you know, where you can see the potential earnings, where you can see the length of time that that, you know, investment will take. The QR code that's on this uh, particular postcard goes to a site that we can actually monitor uh, to see if we got any enrollment from this particular campaign. So we did a sample uh, campaign to a, a thousand um, households with a very targeted uh, approach. And then we partnered that with a digital campaign. So we're not always able to track, you know, like exactly, you know, from the time of interest, you know, when somebody scans a QR code like this to the time that they enroll. But in this particular campaign, we were able to at least do that with one student. So that's not always the case, you know, when we're doing these collaborations. But I think that in, in line with what Dr. DeBurley has presented, presented and the, the feedback that we're hearing uh, from, from faculty as well is that this, this worked for us. Uh, and so we're going to continue with that collaborative focus, but I wanted the uh, trustees to be able to see how really it all works together when you see a final product, right? So there's a lot of behind the scenes conversations, a lot of data that's used, but in the end, this is, you know, what's get, getting delivered uh, to the students or to the prospective students to encourage them to consider our programs. If I may, I got one question, Bill Johnson. I, I see interested in earning upwards of 50,000 for a dental assistant. To be honest, with you, that seems low. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of people that make can make more than that without going to STCC to get a certificate. Or I mean, that might be part of our problem. I, is that a current wage survey for um with what the the dentists are paying 
I can tell you that uh, this is all based on current the current data that we had most currently available. And you'll see on the second part of the slot, the, the other side of the postcard, Trustee Johnson talks about uh, career, amazing career potential with many opportunities for sign-on bonuses. So we did try to, you know, give a more comprehensive outlook for the opportunities, but, you know, we certainly can't make any um promises. Our hope is that uh, they're, they're going to be making a lot more than what we say, but um, this is based on the data that we had at the time that we did this uh, campaign. Well, that, that's how I'm getting, how, how old is the data? Because things have changed drastically within the last year, year and a half is what, where I'm going with all this. It's it's current, correct, Dr. Okay. Duberly? Like within, like the, the data that we've looked at is less than a year old. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I would also like to highlight that um, I think what, maybe what we're thinking in accordance with the industry trends and versus the demographic that some of our students may be coming from, the earning uh, potential that they have experienced prior to coming to us, that $50,000 for some of these students is still going to be a step towards life-changing um, money for them. And so I think it's just something for, you know, the student to build on and for us to build on. You know, some of our students are, the average median income in Springfield is what, $23,000 a year. And so, you know, being able to step out of that into 50,000 is certainly a step in the right direction. It can be life-changing. I, I, I understand that, but dishwashers in a restaurant are making $20 an hour now. Clerks in a, in a convenience store are making you know, nineteen, twenty dollars an hour now. It, it's just, it's, it's crazy. No, I hear what you're saying. We want to make sure that we're able to uh, be. So, I don't know. Is this a two-year program? One year. One year. Yeah, it's. Uh, as I said, it's, it's really a, well, a year and a half in a sense. But one of those, the, the last term is really in the, in the, clin in the placement itself. Okay. But can I ask, I'd like to, uh, in, in tandem with what Trustee McDonald was saying, these are some of the challenges we have. And the same thing with, uh, let's say, medical assisting. Uh, where Bay State, for example, obviously uh, an employer that we work very closely with is desperate for medical assistance, but the what they pay is still not attractive to many of the folks who would need to do the who need to do the two year the two year program. So we have a lot who are just doing a certificate in that sense. So there is the, there is this tension between the amount of education that's being required in certain industries or certain fields, right? versus what the actual salaries look like. So I, I, I think that's the point I'm making. I, I'm actually, you know, giving you guys credit for trying to get the, and the students you're getting. It's just like, it's, it's I, maybe it didn't come off as a compliment, but it's like, I appreciate with what you're doing is it's a tough market out there. And, you know, if, if somebody's going to make, I'm just picking numbers, somebody's going to make $21 an hour and you have to put a year, year and a half to get a degree and they can make 19, 20 without it. It's, it's a hard sell. That's all I'm saying. That, oh, yes. That, well, then, then we're, you, you and I are completely on the same page. Yeah, yeah. That, that's all I'm saying. It's just a hard sell. That's why I just we need to change. And that's why with like the landscaping, I was wondering if we could do more like a workforce development where they don't have to get the spend all the time to get what they need to get a job. That's all. No, I think we're on the same book and page, and I commend you guys for what you're doing. It's just a, it's a very tough market out there. I have to work on my soft skills, I guess, in my presentation, <laughs> but, you know, so no, I, I agree with you guys. It's, it's just tough out there. Thank you. No, thank you, Trustee Johnson. You know, you have to ask the questions and um, we're going to move on to strategic planning. Okay, hey, well, thank you. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking Trustee Esposito for her continued presence and support of the work. And I also appreciate the work of my co-chair, uh, uh, Professor Eileen Cusick and the core team, as well as the Campus Works team. So happy to bring, um, if we go to the next slide, these five draft uh, goal statements to you, which shows the progress that the Strategic Planning Task Force continues to make. Uh, what you see here in these five statements are the broad, high-level thematic areas, which will encompass our strategic plan. Lead the educational ecosystem, elevate our technical mission, clear the path to student success, connect and support, and reimagine stick for a sustainable future. 
So these statements were drafted from the semester long, actually a year long almost work um, that's been ongoing, that's been done by the Strategic Planning Task Force. And um, they have been reviewed in partnership with our cabinet, with Dr. Cook, who've also provided input. They are still in draft mode. And um, But what is really important to note about these goals is that really equity is at the foundation upon which they are built. And if we can go to the next slide, um, these goals are really built through uh, with equity as the lens, and it will also be the foundation for which the objectives uh, will be developed. As the slide states, each strategic goal included in a plan includes specific metrics and actions that align directly with the Massachusetts Board of Higher Education and the Department of Higher Education frameworks for eliminating racial equity gaps in Massachusetts higher education. So really it is through the lens of racial equity that we constructed our high level strategic goals and we'll use these to develop measurable objectives, which is the, the next iteration of the work. So we will begin to draft um, um, and develop some objectives that will align with these goals. And these objectives will, will be built out with metrics and KPIs, key performance indicators that will allow us to chart and measure the progress of our efforts. And the plan will also include um, on the next slides, next two slides that you saw in your packet, the plan will include definitions and a glossary to ensure that we are reading this and approaching the work with a shared consensus and understanding of the terminology that's used throughout the plan. In terms of timeline, um, the plan is to uh, bring the full draft of the strategic plan to the board for the April meeting ambitious, ambitious timeline, we know, but that also gives us a cushion. So if the work does need to push out a little bit, we still uh, have the May meeting as well. But the goal in, in right now is to try to get this draft plan to you with goals and objectives um, by the May, by the April um, Board of Trustee meeting. Any questions about the plan, strategic planning? Uh, I, this is Bill Johnson. I just got a, a comment. I, I agree with what's being said here, but to me, we cannot, we, we can guarantee equality. We treat everybody the same, but equity infers that all the outcomes will be the same. And so you have somebody that may work harder or, or they may be a little smarter or whatever. So the outcome may be different, but we need to guarantee equality that everybody has the same opportunity. Or am I misreading this to what it's saying? It's, what I'm reading here, it says it's going to be create equity in educational outcomes. And that's, uh, we can we can create equality as it relates to the, the educational uh, teachings, but we can't create equality, equity, and the educational outcomes, that's up to each individual individual. Am I, am I missing something or, well, or is that too deep, I'm thinking? <laughs> no, 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 no. I think it's a good question. I mean, you know, people often parse what is the difference between equity and equality. And standardly, the difference um, by definition is when we say that we want to um, approach through the lens of equity, we want to approach through the lens of fairness. So we're not necessarily... Right going to believe that give everyone an equal part, but we are going to give everyone a fair opportunity to be able to achieve um, an equitable outcome. So um, there is no, we can't guarantee, the only equal thing we can, we can put out there is that we're going to give everyone an equitable chance to achieve a degree. Correct. Correct. Right. Okay. So that's, like I said, maybe I'm just not reading enough into it or um, I don't know, but that's all. I, 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 I agree everybody should have the same opportunity. It's just you can't guarantee the same outcome, that's all. Yeah, I think another thing to think about as well is that everyone's going to be you know, given the same opportunity, but some individuals may have other barriers or challenges that they may need assistance in having streamlined to help increase the chance of the same or desired outcome. Um, you know, if you invite someone, for instance, there's this image where everyone's at the baseball field and they're at the fence. Well, everybody was invited to the baseball game, but if they're all at the fence and only one person is 
tall enough to see over the fence and the other person isn't, they were all given the same equal opportunity, but it's not equitable because they can't all view the game in the same fair way. Um, but that's just one way of, of looking at it and thinking about it. But thank you for- That's, I've, I've never heard of it like that. That's a, good, that, that's a good way to look at it. I wish thank I had you. the graphic to show you. It's such a great graphic of the baseball game at the happening uh, yeah. across the fence. So what do you do? You give the person who's height challenged a box to stand on so that they could view the game through the fence. And yep. now- we yeah, have, give me a hammer so they can bust a hole in it. But anyway, <laughs> or that, right? Or that, yes, that, yes, right? Yes, that yes. works, right? Yes, oh, there you go, Bill. There you go. <laughs> okay, so I, I, I do have a question about this. So I know that um, in another internal external meeting, we did discuss and go over the strategic plan, um, and I know that we had the third party. Uh, folks that were there to help present on that. At that time, I felt like it was a little abstract and, you know, it was kind of the idea of some of the strategic goals and things like that. I can't say that I expected to receive kind of a similar update in this internal external meeting. Um, and so I just have some questions on you know, why are we not getting access at least to the draft of these metrics? And maybe these are things that Trustee Spazito is getting access to as the liaison, but I just think I expected to see a little bit more about the measurable objections because this just still feels very abstract to me and strategic planning is very important. And it only happens, you know, what, once every five years. Um, and so I guess I was just looking for a little bit more information. Oh. Yeah, well, I, I can tell you that is the next phase. We have not built out the objectives yet. Uh, you know, this is an inclusive process. So we're bringing the task force together. And our next phase, what was built out at professional day just a few weeks ago, and thank you, Trustee Sposito, for being there um, um, for the group in my during my illness um, at that day. But what we've done is put together and they presented on what was the impact statements that informed the creation and development of these five goals. And now that we have sort of synthesized all of this information down to these five, and I agree they're broad, but they're broad by design because the objectives will be the details that you're seeking for. Um, Trustee McDonald, and that is the next phase of the work. So we're going to be now reconvening um, within the next two weeks and putting and spending time flushing out the objectives. And that will have the more specifics and that will have the metrics. And that's, we'll continue to keep internal and external in the loop as they continue to progress. Okay, that would be helpful just because, you know, this stuff, what I see here, even to toot the institution's horn, you know, a lot of this, we have already been doing, right? Especially talking about streamlining processes and pathways and support systems and things like that. So, you know, I don't wanna say I was disappointed to see what I saw today, but I just was looking for um, a little bit more. So it seems like we're actually moving in, you know, the direction of the metrics and things like that. So, okay. Well, there's quite a few, it's Betty, there's quite a few of the, um, uh, Zoom meetings coming up. I just I got my uh, emails today, um, weekly, and that there's meetings. And um, one thing I wanted to follow up with, and I, I talked to Nanette earlier. Uh, they are they are going to work on getting out to us the trustees um, those presentations that were done. I had talked about them at our meeting, our trustees meeting. Um, the speakers that they had on the day of professional day. So you can, it really gives you an insight into what, what goes into strategic planning. And, you know, we aren't the only community college doing this. Everybody is. And um, so I, that's when I learned a lot and I really enjoyed the videos. So, and they're not real long, but they're very meaty. So they will be getting out to us at some point. So that's it. Thank you.
Shall we go on to the uh, next slide for the alumni? Would you like me to continue? Yes. Okay. So I'm um, happy to report that the uh, work continues to advance uh, the alumni trustee nominating process. We had three candidates uh, who are on the ballot. We have James Morawski, who's a semi-retired teacher, Laura Tompkins, who's an ultrasound technician, and Lori Weiss, who's a VP for finance. Their full bios are in your folder. But by way of update, the ballot was emailed out to alumni on January 27th, and it will close out on February 10th. The committee uh, will meet at that time during the week of February 13th to review the results. And based on the number of votes, make a recommendation to the clerk of the board of trustees that will bring this, um, the winner, the name of the winner to the board to be forwarded along to the governor's office for review and ratification. Okay. In terms of the update on the WTT, WTCC search for a station manager, we are wrapping up our search process and we wanna really thank Trustee Butler Perez for being a liaison to the search committee for this position. Um, by way of context, this will be the first paid position associated with the college's radio station that has, um, that's been staffed by over 50 years by volunteers. Um, and we are happy to move in this direction as we bring and provide professional leadership for our committed and talented station volunteers and radio personalities. Um, we've had representation from two members of the station volunteer leadership on the search committee. So they have been involved. Um, I gave an update, met with the uh, station um, and answered questions um, that they had about, about the search, about the position. So we are nearing the end of our process and hope to have positive outcomes to report at the next meeting. So we will keep you appraised as we go along. Okay. And in the w, WTCC, has their own advisory committee or board or anything like that? They, they Yep. So they, um, what we have now calling an, an advisory board, um, and they also have a station board. Oh, so they have two bodies. It is a station board. Right. So, um, the station board is are the volunteers leadership who have the different roles, the PR role, the GM role, and then the advisory board. That's some a group that's made up of a faculty member, myself, um, our marketing director, um, and representatives from the station, and we come together to talk about sort of the higher level things that are happening at the radio station and, and um, provide guidance in that way. Whereas the station board sort of deals with more of the operational tactical issues that arise. What, what I would offer, I'll jump in right here for, for trustees. And this is the first time I believe we probably put a radio station as an agenda item on a trustee meeting and, and who knows how long. The very fact that we have this uh, arguably lack of clarity with some of the operations is exactly the reason why we have moved forward with the first compensated position in this way for a manager. And it also will need once that hire is made, assuming we can make that hire, we can find that individual is a complete review in light of the fact that we have made clear the license is held by the college. The radio station is of the college. Therefore, what does advisory look like and from which bodies, both the community, but also volunteers, um, all of that will really need a look and a lift by the station manager. And, and I want to be clear and I want to be on the record with that. Thank you, because um, I was thinking along those lines. I think the phrase I had been using uh, was audit. And so, you know, but review, et cetera. Um, and maybe as this fleshes out, there's some other considerations that we can talk about moving forward. Yeah. Okay. Getting that person in there at the helm is going to be key. So thank you for all of you for the support to move forward in that direction. And then uh, lastly, I'm happy to announce we have new foundation board of director members. Um, and they are uh, two alumni and, and one other non-alumni community leader. So we have Damian Harper, who's 
class of 05, who's a first sergeant in the U.S. Army Active Guard Reserve. Uh, we have Joanne Olson, who's a vice president for human resources for Trin Trinity Health of New England. And we have Sarah Smith, class of 97, who's a property manager for Springfield Tower Square. And so a lot of cultivation. Um, uh, some of them came to our attention through our programming um, throughout the fall and certainly from our 55th um, gala celebration. So we're really excited to, to have them as part of the um, foundation board of directors. Excuse me, I got a question. Do we still have the same um, the same person who's the um, who's in charge of the foundation? Jen Brown, who uh, spoke at the fifty fifth gala, is our foundation board president. Okay, all right. I was just making sure. I thought, for some reason, I thought she had left. Okay, great. Okay, no, she's there. Thanks. You're welcome. That's Look, I'm just doing. muting myself. I had a whole conversation with y'all. And y'all, I kept saying, why are they not saying nothing? I wanted to say thank you, Shay, for all you do. And I'm sorry. Y'all know this computer stuff is not for some people. <laughs> and I'm one of those. But anyway, go ahead. I think you did a good job with that. Thank you. Um, and is there a trustee liaison on that foundation board? or We're asking you all that. Oh. I'll be it. <laughs> oh, there you go. I'll be, I, I was going to talk to, um, what's the name? Margate. I was going to suggest, I'll, I'll, I'll volunteer to be on the um, foundation board as a liaison you. for the. Thank you, Trustee Butler Perez. We were not expecting to have a, a hand go up tonight. We were, and frankly, wondering that new alumni trustee yet to be elected. We were thinking they might come in the door with that obligation, but uh, no, I'll do it. I'll do it. I, I think one of us should do it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm excited. I've got, I've got one last question on the uh, radio station. Uh, the general man is that a full time position or a part time position? Part time. Not, as much as it would be nice to be able to recruit on a full time salary, there's not enough job in there. I, I, um, I didn't think so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, if we don't have any more questions or comments, we can move on to the final portion of tonight's agenda, which is the president's perspective. Thank you, everyone. Good to see you. Um, I'll be brief. And again, you've seen the good work by our administrators up and push the work forward on display tonight. Thank you, uh, cabinet members. Um, circling back on some of the items for tonight, just a little bit of context, and then uh, let, me, let me note some of the items that you see on the agenda there. Um, in terms of the personnel report, let me just start with that. You'll see there's just not a lot of activity in terms of comings and goings. Some of the hiring that you're seeing, particularly full-time, uh, the funding source is success fundings, uh, funds. We're going to do, uh, I, I, I think, likely a deep dive into what is success, what is that allocation via the legislature, how that has helped provide us with the ability to hire people we otherwise wouldn't be able to. So again, you're going to see in terms of some of the hirings on that personnel report, underwriting from a, from a particular uh, line of funding. Um, you also see not a lot of retirements, not a lot of movement on that respect. Um, so we'll see uh, what the rest of the semester holds in terms of retirements as we build budget for next year. Again, I say that because out in the world, the, the macroeconomic is unemployment is very low. Um, and as much as there has been you know, change in higher education, uh, we've been pretty sturdy, pretty steady now. Uh, and you'll see that in their personnel report. Um, going back to some of the items, again, just to put a fine point on the enrollment, you, you, we clearly do a deep dive for you all as trustees because enrollment and the management of that, the facilitation of that is a very complex endeavor that we try to really help map through for you. Truly, in the last three years, we were as large this spring semester as 45,000 credits. Now, whether that seems like a lot or a little, when we're at about 35,000, I can tell you that has a very real budget consequence. Um, and also the, the difference is when you look programmatically and even of course, what we've done is show you at the course level, we need faculty to be able to make teaching loads. And when the median class size is five or six students, that becomes a very difficult proposition. So again, we just wanna be real eyes wide open with you all, particularly in this committee 
around how we continue to really try to manage um, our enrollment. Even on the, the modality piece, you saw the idea of face-to-face -face and online. And, and again, you know, I'm mindful of our acronyms, LAPS. We have three different schools. We have School of STEM, pretty self-explanatory. SHIPS is what's called School of Health and Patient Simulation. And then LAPS, that acronym stands for Liberal and Professional Studies. Very different in terms of who's face-to-face -face and who is using more online. And by the way, I just prompt that because students themselves are exercising their choice. As an access institution, again, we provide a lot of opportunity for students to decide how do we fit into their lives. And a lot of times they are opting for that online class. As much as, again, my conversations myself with faculty and a little bit of frustration around why students choose that when it may not always be in their best interest, of course, the students themselves are exercising what they do feel is in their best interest as they balance work, as they balance family, things like that. Um, I hear that conversation. I didn't want you to lose track or that I was losing track of that idea of workforce. I would just say for this for this trustee committee, I have to be very mindful. Um, we may tip into certain conversations where we would probably need an executive session because we would need to talk about the implications around collective bargaining. Uh, as much as, again, it's really important for us to find shorter term, quicker avenues for students to access the skills they need. And we are, as a community college, invested in that. Um, there are very much uh, complications around labor contracts and how we navigate those. So I'm very, very mindful of that. If you'll forgive uh, the lack of specificity on that piece. Um, and uh, what was my last, my last item here? Let me return to the governance thing. Just to look ahead, everyone. Uh, in March, right early, uh, 6th and 7th, we have the New England Commission of Higher Education. They have a visiting team, a two-person team who is going to be on campus. Um, you have seen that progress report that we've put together. We put that in front of you. We talked a bit about that at the full board meeting uh, just last month. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm anticipating good things, positive things from NECI around the work that we have done. Um, and again, we've noted a number of the things, including bylaw review and revision that you've all adopted and endorsed. Um, we've certainly made made strides in that area. And again, look ahead at the full board meeting at the end of March. Um, we are expecting, right, that you all will have that meeting in person and we'll have a chance to debrief uh, that visit from NETI at that meeting on campus at the end of March. Um, so again, uh, a lot of effort, a lot of work to really paint the picture and the landscape from every, everybody tonight. Um, happy to see if there's any questions from me in particular. No questions? Okay. Trustee uh, McDonald, Trustee Butler Perez, I will see you tomorrow. I'll join you uh, for that breakfast. I'll jump in there. Uh, I'm on the earliest flight possible <laughs> to get myself there. <laughs> um, looking forward to being in the mix and, of course, touting um, what we're doing, not in my, only in Western Massachusetts, but obviously here at STCC. Um, there'll be some really good dialogue there. And um, what's not to love about being in the community college sector right now with all the need connected uh, to where um, we, again, can live that sort of transformative piece. I'm just, there's so much to be appreciative about all that. Looking forward to to connecting tomorrow. Yes, well, looking forward to seeing you too. Yes, I think Nate uh, thought you were coming this evening for dinner, so he was slightly disappointed at that, but we'll, you know, we'll welcome you with open Tomorrow, hands. tomorrow, yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, motion to adjourn the meeting. A motion that we adjourn. Second. Bill Johnson, second. Okay, Nanette, can you take the roll call, please? Yes. Um, Mary Kate Murin. Janae McDonald. Yes. Tonya Butler Perez. Yes. Gladys Beck Figueroa. Bill Johnson. Yes. And Betty's Posito.